Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. All right, let's, let's talk about this, your, your dreams, your desires. Uh, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, in him <coughs> and he shall bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Psalm 21, 1 and 2, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him the desire, his heart's desire, and hast not withholden the request of his lips. Psalm 1 and 45, 19. I'm kind of busting along here, aren't I? Hallelujah. Um, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. Hallelujah. He will also hear their cry and will save them. Then Jesus in John 15, 7 says, If ye abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Praise the Lord. You know, we're, we, um, we, we deal with different aspects of people's lives. One of the things we deal with is uh, people having such a bad self-esteem or a bad uh, mindset about you know, God wanting to do things for them. God loves you. Amen? God wants, God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. Amen. That's just the facts. God wants to bless you more than he, you want to be blessed. Or, let's put it this way, God wants to bless you more than many people think they deserve to be blessed. Okay? Now, the opposite side is the crazy people who think they're going to get blessed no matter what because God wants to bless them. You know, God's, God's desire, they get on the other side of that thing, and they go, well, it don't matter what, nothing, 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 God's going to bless me anyway. And we get, we get extremes in the body of Christ. But, I, you know, the fact is, God wants you blessed. Say, God wants me blessed. You know that the Bible says that he wanted to bring the blessing of Abraham on the Gentiles. What's the blessing of Abraham? Surely I will bless thee and bless thee and multiply thee and multiply thee. Amen. You know, uh, Weymouth translation says, I will increase you and increase you. Amen. Bless you and bless you and increase you and increase you. So the blessing of Abraham is the, is the blessing of increase and multiplication. Okay? Blessing and increase. Multiplication. God wants to give it to you. And Jesus said, good measure pressed down and shaken together running over. Amen? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So we live uh, in, in, in the kingdom of God with many people who just don't know how to get blessed or they're afraid to get blessed or, you know, with some of our teaching in the past, we made it so that people thought, well, I don't deserve to be blessed. Well, you didn't deserve to get saved and you didn't deserve to get blessed and you didn't deserve to get filled with the Holy Ghost and you didn't deserve any. We didn't deserve anything. You know, one of the, things that, one of the statements people make all the time just aggravates the ever-loving daylights out of me. You know, somebody gets something. They deserved it. Why? What made you, you know, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm talking about, I've been around people who, um, you know, they're, you know, they got six youngins and they're not married and then somebody goes, uh, but you deserved, you know, uh, this, they deserve that. No. Let's just stop going around, you know. Uh, this, remember a few years ago, uh, one of the cities that had a rough year, one of the northern cities and they were in the World Series or something, they deserved to win. Why? Just give me a reason why they deserved to win. We use that term all the time. And the fact of the matter is, let's, let's just get this, nobody deserved anything. Bottom line, you didn't deserve Jesus to come. You didn't deserve to get healed. You didn't deserve to prosper. You didn't deserve to be blessed. Bottom line, nobody deserved it. Yet, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God sent Jesus to quicken us, to make us alive with him, and raise us up with him, and made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ. Why? Because God loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... Amen. How many whosoever do we have in this room?
How many whosoever's? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay? So, let's get past the deserving thing. No one will ever deserve it. Okay? You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't pay for it. You didn't deserve it. But God, in his love for you, granted it anyway. Okay? So, we, we can, those, those things operate in the realm of grace and in mercy. He's made provision when you didn't deserve it. Like I said, Ephesians chapter 2, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Amen? Hath quickened us together and made us alive together. And then he raised us up together and made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here we are. We, we're going to we're gonna just kind of you know, deal with this. We didn't deserve it, but he made provision anyway. Amen? Amen? So now we're past that. Uh, well, I grew up with an alcoholic parent, or I grew up in a poor house, or I grew up this, and I grew up, and I've never felt like I deserved anything. Well, you know, let's just get past that. That is why there is grace. Amen? The grace and mercy of God has made a provision for you that you can appropriate by faith that you did not deserve to get in the first place. I mean, grace comes from the Greek word chris, and it literally means gift. I mean, it comes from gift. It's the gift of salvation. It's not the, it's not the reward of salvation. Okay? We here? Now, all the things we teach on the other side of, of doing, you know, being, doing good works and doing the things, that doesn't earn you places with God. It's, what we, it's, it's supposed to be birthed out of what's your relationship with God. Okay? But grace is, you know, so God gave you the gift of salvation. Thank God. Say, thank God. God gave me the gift of salvation. Even... And really because I didn't deserve it. And the reason he did it is his great love wherewith he loved me. Okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. I'm watching you. I want to camber on that one right there. <laughs> Will the whole world know if he's raising his hand or not? Carrie. No, that was just <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother Bill's getting ready to slap it up there. I know him. <laughs> and he would, say, he would say, hey, he was, he was sending an email. Watch this. It's at such and such time. There you are. Glory to God. Okay. So, we didn't deserve it. Yet God says that delight yourself in him and he'll give you the desires of your heart. We want, he wants us to delight in him. Amen. And um, you think about it, when we delight in the Lord, now we, we kind of have a two-edged sword here on this statement. He gives you the desires of your heart. One, we can say it this way, delight yourself in the Lord and the desires of your heart will, be, will come from God. In other words, he will plant the desires in your heart. The other side of it is, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and then what the desires that are in your heart, he'll, he'll cause them to come to pass. Okay? I kind of see it both ways. And the reason I see it both ways is God has made provision. You know, the Bible tells us that there are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Say glory to God. We're partakers of the divine nature. Can you say amen? Yet on the other side of that thing, um, you know, it tells us that when we, we, we abide in him and his words abide in us, we'll ask what we will and it'll be given unto us. What happens when you abide in the Lord? You get to know him. What happens when his word abides in you? You get to know what he'll do for you. There's a lot of people, you know, who, who, who try to believe God for things that the Bible doesn't promise them, which tells me what? The word's not abiding in them. Amen? If I'm delighting myself in the Lord, as, as Psalm 37 says, if I'm delighting myself in the Lord, then I'm not going to ask for things that I know that are contrary to his character and his nature. Amen? See, there's so much safety in abiding in the Lord, his word abiding in you, because then you're not going to ask for things that violate his character and his nature, but you are going to have provision made and all kinds of wonderful promises that you can go to the Lord and make requests and get them. Praise God. Amen. And he wants you to have them. How do you know? He made the promise. He did not put it there so you couldn't have it. God, you know, I used to truck tobacco, um, well, I didn't really truck. I would, I, a couple times I rode with the guys. Uh, but we worked in tobacco fields. And one guy I worked for, back, even back in the 70s, when I was working in tobacco fields, they were still trucking with mules. Now, what I mean truck, they have a cart that had a, a divider in it and had a 
a board on the top with canvas, and they would drop that canvas down on both sides, and you would harvest it at the back and then go put it in the cart. And when it got full, you put the sides up, and another one would come. They'd bring, they'd bring another guy in with another cart, another mule, and the other one would go to the barn and drop it off for the, for the people at the barn to put it on the sticks and hang in the, we'd hang it in the barn at lunch. And then at the end of the day, you do it twice. Come in at lunch, hang, and come in at the end of the day and hang the rest of it. And, uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes mules can be stubborn. Well, yeah, they can just be stubborn. So what would they do? So they would actually come up with a back stick and kind of strap it to the harness and hang it out there just far enough where he couldn't hang a carrot down. Where he couldn't get to it. But that dumb animal would just keep following that carrot. God's not like that. He doesn't strap a carrot out in front of you and just get it where you can't ever get to it. And you kind of think, well, that was mean. Well, sometimes the only way to get the, the animal to go to the barn. All right? I mean, you could, now you, you could get out and beat a mule. If he don't want to go, he ain't going. And then you can get out with the back of stick and beat them, and they ain't going. They'll just sit right there. But they hang stick carrot out in front of them sometimes just to get that rascal to go on because he's, he's trying to get to that food. All right? Now, we, we think God's that way. We think God's hanging a carrot out in front of us all the time. When the reality is, God's not hanging a carrot trying to, get, you know, trying to use that to get you to move forward and never going to get it. God wants to bless you, and that's why he gave you all those exceeding great and precious promises. He wants you to have provision. He wants you to have access to them. He doesn't promise things he has no intention of fulfilling or bringing to pass. Okay? So, we're going to delight ourselves in him. He's going to give us the desires of our heart. But remember, we abide in him. He abide, His word abides in us. So that we have uh, governing parameters or governing uh, factors that tell us what we could have as far as our desires of our heart. Like uh, I've said before, you cannot go and believe God for somebody else's spouse. That violates what? His character and his nature and his word. So, the, the, the tempering factor of, you know, he'll give you the desires of your heart is, what well, it comes out of his word. Or is in line with his word. Remember James says over in James 4, I believe 6 and 7 down in the verse 4, uh, 5, 6, 7 down there. You have not because you ask not. Or, now see we have two things here. James covered both the things I talked about, both extremes at the same time. You have not because you ask not. Some people don't ask because they don't think they should have it. Or, you ask amiss, you ask wrongly that you may consume it upon your own lust. That's the other extreme. You got both extremes in that one verse. The truth of the matter is, when you get to know God, when you, when, when you delight yourself in Him, you get to know Daddy. Now, I'll be honest with you, my kids don't have very much problem just asking me for something. Now, Jess has gotten married, she's moved out of the house, and she, she has a little bit of a hard time because she feels like, well, I don't, I'm not there anymore. But, but uh, the, the other two don't have a problem. Jesse really didn't when she lived at home. What was that? When it comes to drinks. Yeah. Yeah, if they come over to the house and the, uh, we, we got a refrigerator in the bonus room and I got Dr. Peppers and Mountain Dews and Pepsis with real sugar in them. I notice there's a, there's a depletion when they leave. You know? They, they don't say, Mr. Taylor, can I go up, you know, Captain, come and go, Mr. Taylor, can I go and get a Dr. Pepper? I'll just hear. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me one <laughs> when you come down. Hallelujah. Amen. I want one too. <clears throat> okay. So you have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. These extremes are signs that you haven't been delighting in the Lord. You haven't been abiding in the Lord and his word hadn't been abiding in you because you've gone into the extremes. When you, when you abide in him, you get to know him. Amen. Now, one thing I can guarantee you, Cap's not going to come over to my house and go, hey, you, 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 got a, you got a Michelob light in the refrigerator? He knows my character. He knows my name. He knows I don't believe in drinking. And he knows we don't have it in the house. And we don't have it in the car. And we don't have it in the cabin. And we don't have it anywhere. If you come to us and we're on the beach and we got, a, we got an ice chest out there, you will open up and you're going to find Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, Pepsi-Cola, Cheerwine. Maybe, Maybe some water. <laughs> well, I got lots of water in there. It's carbonated water. <laughs> Amen. Well, that's, you, you can you just be guaranteed that's what it's going to be like. 
Hallelujah. You know, we have, we, have, uh, we have the old wine of the South, sweet tea, and we have the new wine of the South, cheer wine. Okay? Hallelujah. Those are, those are the wines of the South. Hallelujah. With five E's in the sweet tea. But, my, you know, my family knows there's no need in asking Daddy for, for a beer because you ain't going to get it. What you would get was rebuked. But anyway, <laughs> that you will get that. You'll get rebuked, reproved, corrected, and chastised. May jump on you and cast the drinking devil out of you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are y'all here or you're going home? Well, I just don't see anything wrong with that. I shut up. There's more people spending more time trying to figure out how they can drink and get away with it than they are serving and doing what God wants done. Amen. Well, I just don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, wait till the alcoholic's sitting there and he's about to die from cirrhosis of the liver and tell him you don't see anything wrong with it. Somebody said one time that they don't know any difference between that and, and, and drinking coffee. I, I went and looked. You know what? I have not found anywhere on the, on, on the internet police records arrested for coffee drinking. Yeah, 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 and arrested for public coffee drinking. <laughs> that four people were killed, and the driver was charged with coffee drinking. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what is it? Driving under the influence, driving under D-U-I-C. Driving under the influence of coffee. Amen? They don't call coffee spirits. They call alcohol spirits. wonder why. What, is, what, the, what the Indians used to call it, fire water. They don't call for coffee fire water. So I'm sorry. That's a terrible analogy. Now, back to this. How did I get off on all that? Don't know. It was good anyhow. Huh? Yeah, that's right. So they come over to the house. They're gonna, they're, they know what they can ask Daddy for. Why, well, they know me. When you get to know God, you know what you can ask God for. Because his word will promise you things. I said his word is full of promises. His word is full of things that God wants to do for you. His word, and, and it's just silly to ask things. What, for ask a mess that you may consume it upon your own lust. You don't need another person's wife or another person's husband. That's just, it's, it's beyond silly. It's what? Consuming it upon your own lust. Okay? So, that, so now we kind of settle that. We're not going to ask for things. And we're not going to not ask because we don't deserve it. And we're not going to ask because we just think we can have anything we say. We're going to abide in the Lord. His word's going to abide in us. And what? We can ask what we will and he'll give it to us. I said we can ask what we will and we'll give, he'll give it to us. Dad Hagen used to say, always find scripture that promises you what you're, ask, what you're asking for. <clears throat> See, the scripture will help create desire in your heart. It'll put a hope in you that what, you know, that I could actually have this. I could have financial blessing. I could have, you know, I could have new clothes. You know, listen, some people, they're at a point, just getting new clothes is a big blessing. Hallelujah. Well, start with your socks, move on up, grow in the Lord, get to where, you know, um, uh, Who's, who was it? It was, the, um, it was the minister in England had an orphanage over there, and I can't remember his name right now. Mueller, George Mueller. Thank you. And, uh, you know, he started out, and he, he couldn't hardly believe God for $25 a day to run that orphanage. But after, after about 50 years, he said, I can believe God today for, for, for you know, $10,000 a day or whatever, as easy as I could $25 a day 50 years ago. He grew in faith. He grew in, he grew in wisdom. He grew in faith. He grew in the knowledge of God. And as you grow, your, your faith grows. We have exceeding growing faith. Amen. And so God wants you to know that there are promises here. And the more you spend time with God, and the more you spend in his word, God develops a relationship with you through his word and spending time with him of the things that God wants to do for you. And, and remember, uh, the knowledge of it helps. Well, actually, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. You don't, you know, they run, actually run means run wild. You'll run wild in the arena of healing. You'll be all over the page on healing if you don't know what the word says. Well, I won't, I sure wish the Lord would heal me. Well, the Bible says this, 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 this. Really? I didn't know it said that. Well, you know, you got to get in the word. Amen. So, um, he'll fulfill the desire of them that fear him. Notice, what's fear God? What does it mean to fear God? Anybody know? 
be reverence, reverential awe of God. We're not afraid like a rattlesnake. Now, if a snake came in here, I guarantee you the bunch of us would jump up and run. We, it couldn't matter. If it, it, it could be a garden snake and somebody be out there hacking it up. How do you know? Because I'll be the one doing it. If it slithers, it's dead. I, I kill snake, ask questions later. Well, you know, uh, red, ne uh, uh, red next to, uh, what is it, yellow next to black is a friend of Jack. Red next to yellow, he will kill a fellow. I'm not going to take time to investigate. <laughs> the investigation comes after the head is cut off. Just saying. That's me. Maybe you're like my son who wants to go up and pick him up and look at him and talk to him and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Like, don't do that. All right? Hallelujah. So we're not afraid of God like we are a snake. We are to awe God. Well, let's put it a reverential awe. We're to honor God. We are to desire to please God. We, we, want, to, we want to do things that, that are right in His sight. And see, if, if you um, fear the Lord, those that fear the Lord, means you're not going to ask for things you know are contrary to His character. Right on the other hand, because you're not going to ask for things that are contrary to his character, he's going to reveal himself to you and show you what he will do. And when he starts showing you what he will do, he'll do it through his word. But because your relationship with him and spending time with him, you know his character, his word becomes his oath to you. Have you ever had anybody promise you something and you just walked away and went, yeah, sure. You know? I've had people come out and say, oh, we'll be back next week. Never see him again. Well, I didn't have any way of knowing what their oath or their word was when I met them. Okay? Somebody says, we'll be back. They come back. They stay. Then you'll get to know them over the years. And you, one you thing you find out is you can ask them something, and they'll do exactly what they said they do. Then their word, their relationship, has given has giving credence to their word because you know them. They do what they say. That means if you find they say something else. You know, they come up to you and say, Pastor, I'm going to do such and such. I mean, I, I, I'm going to give $5,000 to church next week. <laughs> I'm letting the deposit slip out. Hello? Whenever you show up, it's going in. All right? There's some people say, I'm going to get $5,000 for the church next week, and you're thinking, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Are you bringing a check, cash, or cashier's check? You know? Why? Because, because you know them. You know their word or their lack of it. And what happens when you don't have, when you don't have confidence in, their, in their, your, their character and their nature, and they say something, you don't believe it? When you, that's why he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you have to spend time with God. And as you get to know God, then the things that God promises you suddenly take on a different meaning because you know he'll do what he said he would do. Because he, he, he's honorable. He cannot lie. Amen? I said he cannot lie. I said God cannot lie. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God cannot lie? Amen? Hallelujah. And because of that, now as you spend time with God, spend time in his word, then as you look into the word, you start seeing things. I'll bless you coming in and bless you going out. I'll bless you in the fruit of your body, in your field, in your, you know, uh, in your vineyards, in your uh, orchards, and I'll bless your cattle, and I'll bless this, and I'll bless that. You've walked with God so long. Now God says, I'll bless you. You go, yes, he will. Now desires begin to rise up, and you begin to have a desire. Your desire is the hope of your future. After the desire comes something called very interesting vision. What's vision? How to. Your vision is the how to get the desire. Okay? What's vision? Your faith. It is the steps you take in faith to walk in the hope that you have. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not things not seen. You, you have the vision. You set it out there. And let me say this. You cannot have a vision without a hope or a desire. The vision is the steps. The desire is the end result. It's the hope. I would like to have... Um, Oh, let's say it this way. I'd like to have a new house. That's a hope. Your vision is the steps you're going to take to get there. And that's called walking by faith. You begin to say, you, you know, and of course, there's certain things. It's, there's certain things you've got to put in operation. You go, you go like, well, I don't have a job. Well, I need to get a job. 
God, God grants me a job. Why? Because by end, the end of what I want, my desire is that house. And so in that faith walk, you begin to get the steps to order and to walk in to receive that. Your faith lays hold of that and you begin to walk out the, the vision or the, perp or the steps to get there. Because the end is your hope, what you wanted, your desire. Faith without works is dead, being alone. Amen? See? Um, if you don't have, so, you know, you got to have faith. You got to have hope. You got to have hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith puts into operation the things that you need to do or to come to pass to get what you hope, you hope for. Hope is your desire. It really is a silly, it's just simply your desire. What you want. What the end of everything you want. Now, see, God gave us a word a number of years ago. I was sitting here the other day thinking about it. I looked out here and thought, my God, we've been, we've been through a rough place. But you know, the Lord spoke in 1989. And I had a vision. Glory to God. Now, not, this, this isn't vision in the sense of write the vision, make it plain, or the steps to get there. Remember, but Habakkuk says write the vision, make it plain, that he, write it on the table, that he that readeth it may run with it. Well, that's the steps. Okay? But the Lord spoke to us in, in, in a vision. I had a, I was, we were in the, the, uh, the first building we were in when we came to Greensboro, and uh, well, uh, we, were, we were in a service, and I had a vision, and in that vision I saw several things, and one of the things I saw was our church was like a, a square or commercial building, really, with revolving doors on it, and as far as you could see in every direction, people were coming to the doors, and they were, there, there was no light in them. They were, they were spiritually dark. When they went through the revolving door, they came out, and the light of God was in them. And the Lord said, and I'm not going to share the whole thing, but the Lord said, he said the revival will start here in Greensboro and spread up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. That was 1989. That's been, you know, 24, 25 years ago, 26 years ago. Hasn't come to pass. Well, write the vision. Make it plain. We've, you know, um, we, we have, we, God showed us, and God spoke to us, and God declared unto us. We haven't seen it yet. Amen. Well, you know what, I, I was sitting here this morning thinking, well, Lord, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> but you know what? You know what he also says in Habakkuk? For the vision is for an appointed time. See, a lot of times God shows us things, we try to go out and make it happen, instead of just walking in the steps God gives us in the process. It's for an appointed time. Listen to this. At the end, it shall speak. Didn't say it speak in the middle. Didn't say it speak in the beginning. It said it would speak at the end. And what? Not lie. And not lie. Though it tarry, this almost sounds double talk. Wait for it because it'll surely come. It will not tarry. Now, why does it say that? Because see, God's saying, He told you already told us up front, it's for an appointed time. And though it looks like it's tarrying to you, wait. Don't you know that you have need of patience? That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise? Would you like Pastor Ed to have 6,000 people by now and just be doing da 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 and not even have to think about you? Oh. Would you like it when you have so many people in church that if, that if somebody left, it, it, you, I mean, now listen, take the, don't take this wrong, but if somebody left, it didn't even give you a, a burp and how the church ran. They just kept right on going. You know? And you don't want people to leave. You don't want people to go to miss God or go to the wrong direction or miss out on what God has for them. That's not the thing. But you know, you like, it'd be nice to be in a place where it didn't matter if they, they were there or not in, in certain realms of being able to do what God called you to do. You know? That, that'd be a nice place to be all the time. It really would be a nice place to be all the time. Amen. It would really be nice. But you know what? You know, it, you know, it doesn't matter if God said something's going to happen a certain way and you're walking with, and, and with you in harmony with the will of God and doing what God said do and doing, it, doing what God, what and how God said do it. It doesn't matter uh, what's happening in between. He said at the end it'll speak. Do y'all know that everybody, actually, there's some state people saying, I don't know, I, I need to go look on snoops.com or go trace it out. Somebody said that the leader of the church at Rome said that Jesus' ministry was a failure because of the cross. And I, I, don't, I, I need to find that out because I'd like to prove that out. Um, but if that's so, that's not true. 
As a matter of fact, what looked like a failure was absolutely the victory. The app, he lost everybody. His closest group uh, forsook him. The biggest mouth of the bunch forsook him. And, in, and, and, and at that moment and at that time in history, in every realm conceivable, it looked like what Jesus had come to do had failed. But, everybody say but. On the third day, the greatest victory of all was accomplished. I said, Hallelujah, he was raised from the dead. And he took his own blood into the mercy seat. And to the heavenly place, and to the heavenly holy of holies, and placed it on the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat, his blood brought the greatest victory from the greatest defeat. Hallelujah. What looked like the greatest defeat, the greatest victory came. And at the end of his earthly ministry, it spoke. And it brought to pass the plan and purpose of God. Amen. You. In this room, I know many have dreams, have visions, have things that's in your heart, things you've wanted to do, and it looks like you're never going to get there. Amen. I said amen. There's been a many a man who's lived his life, and it wasn't until the end, near the end, or later in the ministry or whatever, that, or a little bit later in life, that the things that they, they, they knew years earlier came to pass. I remember God spoke to me in the very beginning when I first got saved that, you know, I would be going to the Orient to minister. You know how long it took? Anybody know how long it took? 20? 20? 20 years. 20 years. 20 years from the time I got saved to the time that what I was first spoken to me a month after I was saved came to pass. 20 years. It was so long and coming, I actually kind of had just dropped and thought maybe I was just drinking, you know, uh, too much carbonated drink or, you know, uh, ate a, to a tamale or something or, you know, had a big pizza dream or whatever. I thought something was going on other than God speaking and then it happened. And, I, and it happened like that. I said, when the door opened, it opened like that. And it happened. I'll never forget stepping off the plane onto the tarmac. Hallelujah, because for some reason, I don't know why, when we landed in Bangkok, we were out on the, we had to, we had to get off the, on the plane and get on, get on the bus and ride up. So he stepped out there, and I, so my, I stepped off the plane, and I stepped on the ground in Bangkok. And it took every, you know, all you had to fight back the tears because God had spoken 20 years before. See, it spoke at the end. There's times I didn't even think it was going to happen. Your brain just started, oh, well. Oh, well, I didn't have to make it happen. God opened the door. Other things took place that opened the doors. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. And so, you know, in your own personal life, there are things that, you know, you have in your heart. There are things of ministry. There are things of, of serving God. There are things, and just look, can we say this? Just natural things, houses and cars or, you know, different things that you, you, you would like to have. Can I share something really cool? Now, I, you know, I've, I, when I was a, uh, Younger. Now, my first car was a Ford Falcon, 64. Three-speed on the column. With enough Bondo on it. Actually, we had to put extra shock on one side because it was lean. No, I was just a joke. But if somebody had hit that car, you would have you lost, you know, 45 pounds of Bondo out there in the middle of the road. Okay? I mean, that, it would be that, that, one, that one quarter panel on the driver's side was so Bondoed out. I mean, that was back in the day. You just drilled holes in and, and you filled it. They, they didn't, they, they, now they, snap, they pull it back out. And if it's too bad, they just replace it. But back then, they would, they, would, uh, they, they would just drill holes so the bonding would get in the holes, and they would just keep filling it and filling it and filling it until they got in you know, and sand it out. And, you know, you had an extra 60 pounds on your car. Painted good, looked good. You didn't know it, you know. Gas mileage went down a little bit. But when I got rid of the Falcon, I bought a, a 1974 Fiat Sports, 124 Sports Spider. British racing green, tan interior, spoke wheels, luggage rack on the, on the trunk. Tan top. We actually had black top. We wore out. I put. A, I replaced it with a tan top. You know, put an eight-track player in it. Couldn't. I had to take my hand off the stick shift to get into fifth because the eight-track stuck out so far. Either that, or stick, kind of stick my hand down under the knob and pull it. You know. 
And uh, I've always kind of had an affinity. But then I traded that in for a Spider 2000, 1979 Spider 2000. And uh, but then I went, got saved, went to Bible school, sold it, got me a, a demon car, the Gremlin. Because I couldn't afford the payments to go to Raymond for the insurance and, and for the car. I just didn't, I didn't know anything about faith. I just knew I love God, so I was supposed to go to Raymond. I've always wanted a, a spider. I've always wanted, you know, I you know, uh, couldn't get them. They didn't make them anymore. And you could get, get old ones, but if you got an old one, you had to get the, had to get the parts car. You had to have two. You had to have the car and the parts car, you know, because, you know, if something tore up, you had to go get the part off the other car to fix it with. Either that or you had, to, had some special company that could manufacture a replacement fuel pump or clutch or whatever. So this wasn't feasible. But guess what they're coming out with in 2016, early 2017? Retro 124 Sports Spider by Fiat. Just talked to the place the other day. So we had there getting something done on Shannon's car. I said, man, I wish you guys bring out the Spider. Bring the Spider. He said, we are. <laughs> Guess where my faith's going. <laughs> they said, they, now they got the, out, see, they own Alfa Romeo too. So they had the Alfa Romeo Spider, but that's 80,000. Yeah. And, and they're going to compete with the Miata. So that's probably, yeah. When can I get on the waiting list? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to have me a Fiat 124 Spider again. Huh? I want a British race of green with a tan top. I mean, I could go with red, but I, I really like the British race of green. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, now that's a desire of my heart. Now, I'm going to have to, God's going to have to give me faith and put, you know, not, well, faith's going to have to be developed. We're going to have to put steps in operation to get there. But I believe I'm going to be driving me around in a 124 Spider, retro Spider. Hallelujah. Why well, retro? Because then it's going to have all the cool stuff. It's going to have the USB. It's going to have all the stuff. And Janie doesn't know it, but it's going to be five-speed. Either that or an automatic manual, one of those, you know, so I can. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, God, God loves us. He said, God doesn't mind me wanting that. He knows I like that car. He knows I enjoy that car. He knows I got rid of having that car so I could go to ministry. And I have never regret, not one, day, not one day have I regretted doing that. I've never looked back and thought, man, if I had just not gone to Ram, I, would, I could have kept it. Not one time have I thought about that, like that. It was just something you did. It was what I needed to do to do what God called me to do. But he sure knows I would like to have one. I believe I'm going to have it. I believe I'm going to have it. Hallelujah. It may not be, you know, the first one off the production line, but I'm going to have it. Wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind have the first one off the production line. No, nah, maybe not. Maybe they need to work out a couple of kinks. All right? So, but God says, you have to see the vision. You have to write it down. It will not lie. At the end, it will speak. At the end, it will speak. At the end, it will speak. There are things in our life that we're waiting on that we think, is it ever going to happen? And God said, it won't lie. It won't lie. It won't lie. It's going to speak. Everybody say, it's going to speak. What's it going to speak? It's going to speak answers. It's going to speak what you're, call, what you're calling it. Glory to God. So what are we going to do? We are going to spend time with God. We're going to spend time in his word. We're going to let him develop in us faith out of that relationship and out of his word so that we can lay hold of the hope or the desire of our heart and bring it to pass. And I'll make this statement. I made this statement over Winston this morning, and, and, uh, but we don't record over there, so I want to record it for this. Not everything you believe God for has to be spiritual in the sense of I'm believing for more souls, I'm believing for more uh, this, I'm believing... That should be our priorities of life. But God made you human too, made you flesh. He wants your flesh blessed. Beloved, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. What's that? John's writing and saying, yes, prospering in your soul, prospering in the realm of the spirit is paramount. But he wants you to be in health and prosper in the natural. God wants to bless you naturally. I said, God wants to bless you naturally. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Now, the devil is one of the areas that we've been attacked in as a church is financially. And when, some of that's been just by calling people off and, and drawing the money down. But you know what? God said the vision will not lie. It shall speak it in. We're at the place I believe it speaks. The Lord spoke to Janie in August, and she just shared this with me the other day because she wrote it down and ran back across her Bible. We were in a service, and she wrote it down. The Lord said all the pieces are coming together. Now, in the natural, it looks like all the pieces, what, are not coming together. Though it tarry, wait for it. See, that though you tarry, wait for it, is really, though it doesn't look like you think it should, wait. Because I spoke it. It's not going to lie. It's going to speak, and it shall come to pass, and it won't tarry. In God's timing, it won't tarry. Now, would I like to have 500 people here last month? Yes. We don't. But he said it won't tarry. It'll come to pass. Now, as a, as a, as a body, I had to trust God. As, as a pastor and a body, I trust God. As an individual, these things work on your individual level. And let me say something. I do not believe that God is going to bless Benny with $25,000 and not, and not be willing to do the same for Josh. There's not a higher anointing in walking in the visions and dreams of God. It's Bible. It's relationship. I love my children. I am not going to go and give Jesse $60,000 and turn, turn around and tell Shannon, oh, well, tough, you don't need it. You've got a job, you don't need it. So I'm going to give Jesse 60 and, you know, oh, so I'm out working and, and doing the right things and you're not going to do anything for me, but she's home being a bum. <laughs> and you're going to give her all this money. God doesn't work that way. I said, God doesn't work that way. Amen? What will work for Jessica will work for Shannon. What will work for Jesse and Shannon will work for Nathan. What will work for Benny will work for Josh. Amen? What will work for Josh will work for Penny. If you will let, spend the time with God, spend the time in his word, let him develop the desires, have the faith for it, you can walk it out and see it in Jesus' name. Amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.